in business, it is not simply the cost of the goods, the difference, now you have money. You're not in business. If you're in that, you're, you're in survival. Our guest for this episode is the CEO of Centonomy. While our Jewish Centonomy is a leading financial literacy and entrepreneurship education company. Whichever level of income you have, if you don't know where your money is going, you can't make good decisions. So control. So wealth, creation and stinginess. Not stinginess, control. Mr. Waidaka Gatumi has mastered the art of explaining money using very relatable, real-life examples that give you a clear picture of a financial fix and how to escape or avoid it. When a business has not made a profit, but neither, praise the Lord, has it made a loss. It's a very important point. So now that you know that, what will you do? What, as a business owner, what would you do? Zaka is an experienced money trainer and one of my highlights has to be the genius of explaining how you lose money without noticing. If you buy a new car and you come and park it outside here for all these guys. See guys who come and say, Eish! nice car, yeah? Mm -hmm. Then they go on with your life. You've been left with a loan for five years for somebody to say, mm, he drives a nice, nice car. car. And the take home from this has to be how to fix that situation. Put all your money in investment suddenly and that investment doesn't work, then you're in trouble in the short term. So, what's the best way? You know, with the episodes we have produced so far, I've noticed that in my quest to get a deeper understanding of how money works, the more you speak to different players in different sectors and on different levels, the more you realize that there's so much to learn. If you're an entrepreneur, Profit is not your money. But I worked for it. It no, is my idea. You worked for your salary. That's one way you get money from it. It is business. my idea. Ah, ah, I ah, came ah, up with it. My brother, here, you see, this is the mistake we make. Oidaka holds a Bachelor of Arts in Media and Communications degree from the Melbourne University, and today we get to tap into his deep well of financial knowledge and the experience he has gathered over time. I sold a, a, a show to the television station. We were not even paid in shillings, we were paid in dollars. Ow. Hey, now I said, where are dollars spent? <laughs> <laughs> They're not spent locally here. Yeah. I'm Dr. Kingori, and here's another reason to stay subscribed to our channel. Come how just subscribe. Now's a good time to hit subscribe and turn on the notifications bell. Uh, I believe I can quote you on uh, something, a, a very interesting definition of wealth, living in abundance. Uh, <laughs> it's a very interesting definition, but what really is living in abundance? Is it the same for everybody? Um, yeah, I think it is. In that, Living in abundance. Yes. Um, because I think the biggest issue that we have around this thing called wealth yeah. is that for all of us, we've never defined it for ourselves. Like you've never actually said, what does wealth mean to me? Because mm -hmm. many people say, I want to be rich. Okay. Yes. yes so yes. next question, how rich? Okay. So okay. is it a millionaire in shillings? Mm-hmm. Is it a millionaire in dollars? Yes, yes. Which one is it? Like, and a millionaire in dollars is a billionaire in shillings. Well, it's, along, it's on the way there. Yes, it's yes, on yes. the way. A few yes. hundred million shillings is what you're talking about. Yes. So, so if you don't define it, then you don't know if you're there yet. Like it's not something that is, uh, it's, it's something that is very personal, something that you have to define for yourself. What does abundance mean to you? Mm. I don't know if you remember the, this, I always use it in our classes. Mm. Um, the example of this, um, he was a teacher, I think he was Opus Dei from, from Rift Valley, I think called Tabich. I don't even remember yes, something yes, like yes, that, yes. if you he remember. He won a hundred million shillings. It was something yes, like yes, that, yes. but it was a million dollars, I think, yes, his yes, price. Yes. Now, for him, he didn't use any of that money on himself. That's the abundance for his life, because for him, it was about being able to give and make a difference in the lives of others. Now, here's the thing. If I won a million dollars, let me explain. You would, <laughs> you would know yes, that yes, I have won yes. a million dollars because yes. for me, it's a different definition. Mm. Now, it doesn't mean that I don't want to give and share with other people, but yes. I'm not going to give everything else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for him, that definition, he defined for himself what it meant to be wealthy. And so I'd encourage anybody who's thinking about growing wealth to be clear, what does wealth mean to you?
So yes. I believe it's accurate to say that yeah. depression mm -hmm. uh, starts as defining your wealth standards yes. by someone else. Well, I am not a psychologist, so I don't know where depression <laughs> starts. Okay. But depression is yeah. a strong word, yes. like um, the feeling of uh, inadequacy, the feeling yeah. that you are not there. Because right? you're not the same as anybody else. That's the point. So, we, so if you're trying to race against somebody else who's in a completely different race than you are, then you're obviously going to be upset because you cannot do what... I can't sit here. I mean, like, I watch your show, man, and I can't make people laugh like you. That's, <laughs> hey, that's you. your gift. Mm -hmm. So if I try and do what you do, mm -hmm. I'm going to find myself constantly being behind. Yeah. But guess what? Here's the, here's the best thing about this, is no one can do what I can. Yeah. Like, yeah. when I'm at my best, yeah. in the area of gifting that God has given me, no one can touch me. Okay. Because no one is like me. I am, comp I am the one unique Waidaka Gatumia in this world. Mm -hmm. There has never been and there will never be another one. Now, there are people who will be like me, but they will never be me. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for mentioning God. And I'll tell you why I thank you for mentioning God. Yeah. But before we go to that, yeah. something you said. Yes. Like, if wealth is what you define by yourself. Yes. So the, it's also accurate to say that there are millionaires who are more wealthy or wealthier yes. than a billion. Than billion. Yes. Yes. There's someone who has 100,000, but they are wealthier than someone with 100 million. Yes. Okay, back to Why? The because they find that satisfaction. And if you, you see, if, you're, if you have an outcome that you're aiming for and you achieve that outcome, then you find satisfaction in that. But if, if this, the outcome is constantly out of your reach, then you're never satisfied. Then what's the difference yes. between satisfaction and yeah. comfort zone? Wow, <laughs> you have all the best questions in the world. <laughs> What's the difference between satisfaction, satisfaction and, and comfort, comfort zone? zone. Yeah. I think satisfaction is a sense in which you are achieving a specific goal. Comfort zone means that you are um, less aware of the potential for growth and the potential that is around you. Um, Here's, here's something else we talk about in the class. Yes. And, I, and I always say this. Mm. Growth only happens in discomfort. Okay. So if you want to grow, you have to be uncomfortable. Why? Because mm -hmm. it means you're going to have to do something that you're not used to doing. Mm -hmm. You're going to do something that is difficult. That... Here's the thing. If wealth was easy, see, Everybody. then everybody would do it. Sour. That's what I'm saying. So mm -hmm. you have to actually literally get out of comfort. If you want to achieve anything of any importance in the world, yes. you have to become uncomfortable. Yes. If you want to lose weight, you have to be hungry. You know what I mean? If you want to build muscle, you have to lift heavy things. Like it's, you go to the gym, those guys don't look comfortable. Mm. They are uncomfortable because they're saying, I want to achieve something that no one else has. So it's in a place of discomfort. So even the money side of it. Yes. People don't like to invest because they say, oh, risk. Yeah, risk is uncomfortable. Yes, yes. Because you can't control everything in the future. Mm. But you can also not achieve anything if you don't take on board risk. Okay. okay. So, so when you talk about comfort zone, that's what came to mind immediately. I just Makes said, sense. get out of comfort. If you want to grow, you want to achieve anything, yes. don't be comfortable. Don't be comfortable. But if you are satisfied with 100,000 shillings, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and it solves all your problems, yeah. like the people who talk about, ah, mazimi mini kipata 50k, yeah. it will solve all my problems in the world. Yeah. And then you get that 50k, now ukosawa, right? Mm -hmm. It solves the problems that you had seen hapo, now ukosawa, right? Yeah. Yes, you have the potential of getting a million, yeah. but ukosawa, mm. now you're 100,000. Mm. That's still a comfort zone. It is... But from my experience, those who are disciplined enough, those who work hard enough to achieve those positions, mm -hmm. tend to find another level once they get there. Mm. And I think that reflects the image that God has put into us. Yes. That in as much as that, you know, that we have, you know, you've achieved this specific goal, there'll always be another one. Mm. Like there'll always be something else that's driving you. Now, there's a balance to be found in it. Because I think if you're only being driven by the future, you miss out on the present. And if you're only in the present, that you're, then you're putting your future at risk. So there's a, there's a balance. I think there's importance in being able to 
take a moment and celebrate and yes. enjoy. Yes. So even when we talk about our investment strategy at Centonomy, we never tell people it's all about the future because then you, you lose motivation. Yeah. So we're talking about things like, hey, have you planned a holiday for this year? Okay. You know, have you, don't just think about your children's education in 10 years, your retirement in 20 years, whatever, all those different things. They are important, but you also need to put in your financial plan. How are we going to enjoy ourselves this year? Okay. This past, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, it was, everyone is, was in Naivasha. That's a great financial goal to say next year I'm going to go to watch WRC mm -hmm. in Naivasha and I'm going to go debt free. That's a goal. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, we're in our system. We <laughs> believe that people actually commit to go to Naivasha to watch WRC. Yeah, why not? Okay. Why Thank not? You. Mm -mm. So. <laughs> Go actually, let me tell you, book holidays now. Mm -hmm. You know, we're at the beginning of the year. Book your holiday for December. In fact, book the flight. You get such discounts that you go and you enjoy without taking on debt. And mm -hmm. next day, you'll even begin to plan where is the other place you're going to go. So okay. all these things matter, the present and the future. And so you have to find that balance. They do matter. Yeah. So how do you... How do you strategize? Like, what are some of the strategies you put in place yeah. to find that balance? And so that you don't get carried away with enjoying the now so much mm -hmm. that you affect the future, or you focus on the future so much that you forget to, to, forget to enjoy the now. I hope you don't mind me sounding like a broken record. No, no, no. It's, 20, 20, it's, 29. Listen, 29, it's please. setting goals, making plans. And sometimes we make, you know, we make this idea of goal setting and everything so complicated. We think that you require every skill in the world. No, just decide. Say, this is what I want. But the truth of the matter is this. It's a simple question. It's not an easy question. Because when you start saying what you want, you begin to realize the cost. So in doing so, you become realistic with your personal goals because that's the thing. Everyone, I, I talk to young guys, you say, I want to be a billionaire. Okay, good. Can you do what billionaires do? How many times have you achieved your New Year resolutions? Because we all have goals. <laughs> we all make those plans. What goes wrong? So, in part of your financial planning system, mm -hmm. it's actually to make it a system. Like not, if you, if you make it something that you have to continuously make choices on a daily basis, you're going to find yourself in trouble. But if you make it a system, so like, for example, we set, you set a savings goal, okay? And in the class at Centonomy, we always tell guys, a good savings goal, it's an example. It's not the only one in the world. So like mm -hmm. A good savings goal is to have six months worth of your current income in a savings account, okay? Mm -hmm. Usually that will take people between three and four years to save. Okay, three, sorry, three to five years to save. Three to five years to yes. save six months. Yes. Uh -huh. Because you, you can't save all your monthly income. How will you live? So you have to be putting aside a small amount mm -hmm. on a regular basis. Now, what you do after that is that you automate it. What does that mean? You say, okay, I will be saving 10,000 every month, five, whatever number it is, every month. And that's it. So your lifestyle is now your lifestyle minus 10,000. It stops being something that you have to every month think now, hey, how much am I going to put aside? Ah, ah, ah. So you set the goal. Now you make it automated. That means you put it aside every month like tax. Okay. It becomes like that. Like your tithe and offering a church. You know, you don't think about those things. It's a number. Mm. And you just put it aside. So your lifestyle will now fit the rest of the cash that you have. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing even with investments. You say, this is the goal that I have. You do the calculation to figure out how long will it take to get there, how much do you have now, and you just automate it because you have made a decision. Okay. And it's the same thing. Come on, these are things we practice even in school. Okay. In school, what do you think preps were? Preps are you need to spend time studying in order to pass your exam. So what do we do every day? At six in the morning, every day, at six in the evening, for an hour, you're going to sit with your books and study. And it stops being an issue that you have to think deeply about every day. It's a habit. 
And then there are people who read towards the exam yes. because you, it's inevitable and you have to do something about it. Yeah. And a lot of people have a problem with this concept, you're saving six months of your spending. Yeah. Because that means you're also predicting uh, like six months is how much trouble you can be in. It's like yeah. you, once you save the six months yeah. and then COVID happened, yeah. prayers are, Mungu, please <laughs> let this COVID last for six months only yeah. because beyond that, yeah. I'll need another five years. That's to go right. back here. That's right. That's as in why six months? So we, it's a target. You see, the problem with just saving is that if it's just a general thing out there, you don't know how much you're working towards. Mm -hmm. And human beings, we are aiming creatures, mm -hmm. right? We aim for things. There's, I, I can't remember. I think what's his name? He's a psychologist, Jordan Peterson. He talks about even that's why our eyes are in front. We aim at stuff. Like, so if you don't have something that's dry, pulling you, towards a, a specific goal, then you will not get there. So when we say six months, I said that's an example. You, why not oh. 12? Why not three? But you see, if you put six, it means that you have a target that you're actually working towards. Okay. Think about, okay, so why do we recommend six months? Why? Because six months is a good enough time for you to figure out another plan. Oh, you, you, six months is time to think. To think, not even just to think, but to take action. So that your life is not disrupted for that long a period of time. So within six months, you can look for another job, you'll find another gig, you'll do something, but your life doesn't stop. Mm. Now, the issue that we have is when so many people don't have any savings. So when stuff happens, your life literally stops. And it be, that's now how you get into debt. That's how now you become a burden to other people. So that's, yeah. We That's have conversations idea. between saving culture, investment culture. Yes. Uh, so it means you do not, you cannot subscribe to investing everything. No. Okay. That is a lack of wisdom. Investing Apply everything. Apply wisdom. Why? Investing and saving are two different things altogether. Okay. Saving is putting aside cash that you can use in an emergency. And where you put that money is you're putting it into safe, sec as secure as possible investments. So your primary concern with saving is what? Security. Or in other words, preparing for bad luck. Yes. No. I, don't like, <laughs> I don't like that term. Let me change, but it is, let it me is. change the term. Is mm. that things, the seasons change. Let's talk about it that way. It's not always summer. It's not always winter. Mm -hmm. But seasons change. There'll be seed time and harvest. All these are things that we know about. Yes. So you save so that literally, think about it like this. Our grand, no, your, your, your great grandparents and onwards. Mm -hmm. if, you go to, if you go to a farm, they had this big th thing in the middle of the farm called a granary. I'm not here. Yeah. Okay, I saw sir. that. You saw a it. A granary, yes. A granary. Mm -hmm. So why do you put seeds in there? Why don't you eat it all? Because there will be a season where there is no harvest. And that's the thing. You have to plant in order to receive. So please understand, not all seasons are going to be the same. So wisdom is to have backup for seasons where there is no harvest. Backup. That's what saving is. So when you're putting aside savings, you're looking for an investment that is secure. And when you need the money, you can access it. So your primary concern with saving is what? Security and access. Because when things are thick, you don't want to ask people, sign documents, have to wait three months for it to be released. No, 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 no. If I need money now, it's there. That's saving. Investing is putting your money where it will grow. And I pray it will grow faster than inflation. Because You if pray it will grow faster than <laughs> inflation. I pray that people will invest in investments that grow faster than inflation. Mm -hmm. Why? Because if your money is growing slower than inflation, then you're losing value. And a lot of people are in businesses that actually lose, are losing value. That's it. Or investments that are losing value. This is, can I be as blunt as possible? Mm -hmm. So our research shows that women tend to save more than men. So what does that mean? Save or get saved more than men. <laughs> Both. <laughs> if you okay. go to church, mm -hmm. I think there's evidence of both. Mm -hmm. But women tend to save more than men, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That in the short term, if there are any risks, 
and something happens, they have cash available to take care of it in the short term. But what does that mean? They are not taking enough risk for the long term. So what does that mean now? It means that if you go now over the long term, 10, 20 years, men tend to do better because they tend to invest more than women so that they get a higher return over time. And I'm saying this in general, that's what the research shows, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, it's the opposite for men. Men, because uh, if it is quail eggs, they are there. If it is mushrooms, they are there. Whatever mm -hmm. is the newest cryptocurrency, guys are in it. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? They don't often, men t tend to invest, sorry, to save less, which means they are, susceptible to short-term risk, which means that's why, guys, if you put all your money in investment suddenly and mm. that investment doesn't work, then you're in trouble in the short term. Mm. So what's the best way? Have a balanced approach. Balanced so approach. you save with that goal. Remember, I talked about six months, but you invest at the same time for the long term. You okay. can't just do one. Okay. With our... With our investment strategy, you have to do both. You have to save and you have to invest, which means you have to find security, but you also have to take risk. Okay. Yes. I speak for everybody when okay. I say that everybody saves. Yeah. The difference is how we define emergency. Okay. You see, you could have saved like, um, say, 20,000 shillings. Yeah. Accessible, mm -hmm. all those rules, mm -hmm. kawaida. Mm -hmm. But then you're so hungry. <laughs> You get so hungry, you are like, nakufanja mm, and I, unachuna kidogo. Then how do we define emergency? You save some money, then uh, then you've fallen sick. Yes. You have two choices. Yeah. Either I pray for a miracle yeah. or go to hospital. Mm -hmm. At what point do you decide to stop trusting God for healing? Uende uchomwe ile, uende hospitali. As in, what's the threshold of an emergency <laughs> when you have saved money? Look, you have to trust God, whether you have money or not, for healing. Because I honestly believe God is the source of healing. However, however, why we're having this discussion is because your life is not one thing. It is multiple things. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about personal financial knowledge, personal financial management, mm -hmm. it means that you're taking into account all as elements of your life. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to health, for example, because that's the example you've given to me. Yes. Then insurance becomes such a powerful tool. And when I talk about insurance, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about you have to go to one of these fancy insurance firms. Mm -hmm. I know we are changing now between NHIF and SHIF, yes, right? SHIF, no yes. problem. NHIF by itself is such a powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Because what does that mean? For many of the medical needs that you have, if they occur you are covered at a mm -hmm. significant rate. Okay. And let me tell you, I've seen the power of NHIF in my own family. Mm -hmm. Because I have parents now who are older, right? Now they're in the retirement age and above. You'd be surprised how many of the tests and treatments are available for them if you continue to give them that cover. Okay. So if you're thinking about, oh, it's going to be a health emergency, then insurance is a better tool than saving. So saving is for problems that are not insured. That you cannot insure for. So if you have property, like your house, insure it. Your phone, if, because for many of us, our phone is one of our most prized possessions. You know, you can't do it. In fact, all your business happens on your phone, then insure it. So that if it's stolen, gets, you know, things go wrong, you have a phone. Mm. But people think that many times that, yeah, this thing of BIMA, you know, insurance is... For the phone, I think you for the phone, that's like funding the robbery industry. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> You're fine. But you see, you tell me, if your phone disappears, what happens to your life in that moment? Then suddenly you have to find money to buy another phone. Because you cannot now survive in this economy without your phone. Yes. So, for many people, that's where your business is. If you own a business and people are paying you via M-Pesa on your phone... That's your whole business. So you yes, have to do something yes, about it. Yes, yes, yes. But what I'm trying to say is, if you have property, mm -hmm. insure. You see, that's a better financial tool than simply saving. So saving mm -hmm. is to take care of the things you can't insure against. Mm -hmm. That's what you're trying to do. Okay. So have, what, what we do in the classes is, we, it's nothing 
like spectacular that you have never had. But what we're trying to do is get you to think through what are all the issues that face you financially? How do you make a plan for them? Because we tend to make plans in emergencies. And in emergencies, the worst time to make a plan because you're stressed, you don't have time. So all the choices you're making are limited. So make a plan before emergencies happen. Make a plan in order to reach your goals. Mm. That's what we're trying to get across. So the threshold yes. of uh, emergency yes. is your view of your financial needs yeah. and the things that you cannot ensure. So yeah. you save money to cover that. That's right. Okay. And most of the time, that's cash flow issues. So it's like your salary. That's the kind of thing, like the, the, the money that constantly comes into your pocket, mm -hmm. that's the one that is hard to insure. So you want to have money that will be able to cover that for a period of time. That's mm -hmm. why you used six months of your income mm -hmm. as an example. Okay. Yeah. Sawa, I told you that um, I'm glad you mentioned God. Mm -hmm. So thank God you mentioned God. Okay. So there, there's a case for money being spiritual. Yes. And, and so now we go scientific and we go professional. Mm -hmm. Have you ever scratched your palm? Laugh, you got money. <laughs> no. <laughs> You've never. But I've heard people saying, You've You have scratched. never. I've never, no. Hey. That I can be able to say, I saw at your scratching, and then scared. suddenly money came. No. You're not a true African. It um, works, actually. I, Oh, oh, I've been accused of not being an African. What did I no, do? Really? What did I do? <laughs> ah, okay, Sawa. Let, let's, let's go back yes. to the basics. Mm. Is money, does money have a spiritual connection? Yes. In my opinion, it does. How? I've read the Bible, and, it, and in the Bible we are encouraged. And in fact, we are not encouraged. We are warned that you cannot serve two masters. Mammon, which is the god of wealth, money, and God. So we are being encouraged, hey, it is a God to many people. People worship money. People worship wealth. I think you only have to, come on, you know it is worship. You only have to open Instagram to see who are the people who have the most followers and which posts have the most followers. It's because there's so something people, that is flashy. That's how do you identify devil worshippers, as in <laughs> Instagram, that's a tip. That's a tip. That's a high tip right now. No, but you people can see have... where people's attention is drawn. Like, you're drawn to those mm. things that are, that are images of wealth. And in fact, people try and portray those images of wealth um, as much as they possibly can. So does there's it have a spiritual... images of wealth? Yes. And there's wealth. And there's wealth, yes. So portraying an image of wealth, yes. something you don't have, mm -hmm. is worship of money. Now you're trying to make me a theologian, which I am not. <laughs> But I, I think there's evidence of worship by simply the number of followers of the images of wealth. I hope that's, mm. I hope that's clear. Like if you see where people's attention is, that generally tells you what they worship. Which brings yeah. us to uh, a point here, money talks, right? Uh, there's a conversation between people with real money, mm. don't, don't show it. People who floss around, don't actually have money. Mm -hmm. Is there a truth to that? To some extent, to some extent. Um, it's not 100%, mm -hmm. but I've experienced it where... <laughs> so we often do seminars and webinars at, at Centonomy, and we mm -hmm. try and invite wealthy people to come and give their stories and tell people what that's been yes. through. Yes. And I've not been... I've, I've seen people who I know who are wealthy, as in when you, when you talk about numbers, when they have significant zeros behind their net worth, like significant, significant zeros. zeros. And somebody is comfortable to remove, you know, a, what are they called? Those the uh, credit cards. No, mm -hmm. those two small phones, the Kabambe phones. Oh, are they yes, 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 yes. They're Mika happy to remove yeah. it. in the Oyo. Yes, yes. And they're happy to remove it and they don't care what you think. Okay. Because they have nothing to prove to you. Mm -hmm. Like their, their deepest concern is not what you think about them. That's what I've seen. And I've seen it even in people who are building towards wealth because they stop being worried about what other people think. Why is that such a powerful thing? It's because I can never please you. I can never constantly be on your mind. I always make a joke. Like if you buy a new car and you come and park it outside here for all these guys, See, guys will come and say, 
nice car, mm-hmm. yeah? Mm-hmm. Then they go on with your life. You've been left to the loan for five years for somebody to say, hmm, he drives a nice car. No, and th- after he left there, the guy didn't think about you. You're the only one. In fact, the next week when somebody else comes and parks their nicer car next to yours, suddenly yours disappears. How can you keep up with that? You can't. So I'm not saying don't buy a nice car, but if you're going to buy a nice car, buy it for who? For you. you. Because if it is for you, no one else matters. You, you enjoy it because you can't please everybody. So one of the gateways to wealth creation is accepting that you cannot please people. You can't please everybody. Come on. Even the greatest, you. How many, have you ever gone through the comments on your channels and all your other social media? Yes. we Does everybody love you? No, no, no. So do you stop doing because one or two people don't like what you're talking about? No, you live your life. You can't please everybody. Okay. If you're poor, people will judge you. If you're middle class, people will judge you. If you're wealthy, what do they say about you? The worshiper. Illuminati. So if you, if you try and please everybody, mm. you cannot. So live your own life. But live it on purpose. Do the things that matter to you. So That's as a believer, yes. and I love that word, strong believer, <laughs> uh, this, the, the, the spiritual money connection. Yes. Uh, there are people who believe that there are people who have accumulated wealth. Who accusation there, but there are people who believe mm-hmm. they have accumulated wealth mm-hmm. through witchcraft and mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. In your experience dealing with money, mm-hmm. is money involved, um, is money related to magic in some way, black or miracles? So... In the book of Exodus, Mm -hmm. Moses is sent to Egypt, Mm -hmm. essentially the wealthiest nation in the world. They were not worshippers of God. When he's sent there and he's told, please go and uh, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And when he refuses, take your staff and throw it on the ground and it will become a snake. Uh, Pharaoh had no issues. He was just like... called my people around and they came and did the exact same thing by whatever mm. magic that yes. they were using. Yes. Is there magic and other things that could affect people in this world? I think so. I mm. believe so. Mm-hmm. But I'm very here, sorry, I'm very I, I, but I think if you, if you focus so much on the negative and that's what it is, that's, I think people get caught up and say, oh, the world is rigged we can never achieve anything. I am cursed. Curses can't be broken and that's it. If you come at the world like that, then it becomes true. But if you come at the world and say, you know what? By the grace of God, I can break through and mm-hmm. I can do the thing that I'm called to do. Yeah. Then you can, even in this world. Okay. I, do, I don't think that, um, yeah, I, if, if we focus on that side, then you find yourself in big trouble. Uh, there, is, there, there, is, there is witchcraft, <laughs> there, it, it works for some people. There is miracles, yes. it works for some people. Mm-hmm. And there are principles yeah. that uh, have been put in place yes. uh, to win the money game, yeah. right? What are some of the sure bet principles that you have seen lifting people mm-hmm. from scratch, from grace to grass, from grass to grace? So, uh, there is a principle in the Bible that says, seed, time, harvest. That's it. And I think if we, if we understand that there are seasons that you have to plant in order, to, here's the thing, I think it was Dr. Miles Monroe, mm. he, he was holding seeds in his hand and he was trying to give an illustration and he's saying, this is, this is millions of dollars in my hand worth of seed, but it is completely useless as long as it's in my hand. It's completely useless. If I throw it on this marble ground that you have here, Mm. It is completely useless. Unless you put the seed in the right ground for it to begin to produce, it cannot produce. And so if we are going to get this idea in our mind, wealth doesn't happen just like this. Wealth takes time because you have to plant, you have to go through the process of time, and then there comes a harvest. And that has to be done multiple times over and over again in order for you to achieve the goals that you have. So when you talk about what are those sure bet practices, let's talk about them now. Mm -hmm. So number one is control. If you're out of control, it doesn't matter how much money you have. I'm telling you, at Centonomy, we've trained people 
all levels. In fact, I can't even mention some of the companies that we have trained people because if we do, you will know who that person is. Mm. I mean, we're talking senior executives earning millions of shillings per month and they are still in debt being chased by Shylocks. After you've trained them? No, before. <laughs> before, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we are called to train these guys who are millionaires if, even just by their monthly salary. But because they have never got the discipline of managing that salary, it doesn't matter the size of it. You think it's hard to find a place to spend two million shillings? It's not hard. Okay. You think it's hard to spend a hundred million dollars? It is not hard. You can buy one thing and done. Then where is your money for the next day? Mm -hmm. So if you're out of control, then you're going to find yourself in trouble. So that's principle number one. Number two, you have to set goals. And so when you talk about like out of control, let me give you a simple, simple example. Most people don't know where their money goes. I want you to do a survey with your team here. I can see all these wonderful, great young men and ladies around here. Mm. After this session, I want you to just go through your M-Pesa messages, right? All of you. Mm. And just ask everyone, just add up your transaction costs. Most of us have no idea. And that's a sick. Some of the people in this room, please call me after this. You'll find in a year they could buy a plot with the transaction costs on their phone. Not even what they sent, mm -hmm. not what they received. Mm. That a small number at the bottom that says transaction cost, if you add it up for a year, it could buy you a plot. Okay. For us, this is my wife, and I always give this example because I'm allowed to give it. Mm. Mm. For us, when we did the first time tracking our expenses, we found we were spending more on takeout food than our rent. But mm. that's because takeout food was... I can see even a few boxes of takeout somewhere around here. Mm. It's 200 bob here, 200 bob there. Then you buy a casada somewhere on the way. In a day, we were averaging 500 shillings. Now, the two of us together, because you buy lunch at the office, isn't it? Yeah. Then you might buy a coffee or something like that. Mm. So that's 500 per day. Monday to Friday, that's 2,500. Mm. Then on Saturday, where do you go? Mm. Now you go to the nice the nice place and then you spend and when we added it up it was more than our rent but we didn't know because we thought it's small small amounts so if you have no awareness of where your money is going oh and i can hear people saying oh but hey that's you executives you're earning a lot of money you can even eat out every day okay fine let's let's simplify we did the same thing with our house help an amazing lady she went through her Expenses. We're trying to find where there are gaps and things. We found, do you know how many ringtones she had on her phone? Mm -hmm. She had five ringtones. An average of two shillings per ringtone per day. Okay. What does that mean? You're spending 10 shillings, nearly 100 shillings, between 70 and 100 shillings per week on ringtones that we enjoy when we call you. Okay. Now, I'm not against the whole ringtones business. I think it's really good for artists. It's doing a great job. But do I need five on my phone? To entertain the missed caller. Like. Yes. So, when I get tired of the old ones, you replace with a new one. Instead of spending 10 shillings a day, spend ah, ten, one five. Yeah, yeah. But the, the thing was, she didn't know. She always used to wonder, my airtime is finished every week so quickly. And there were all these services on her phone. So you'd think it's just something that, you know, okay. wealthy people have, or people with a lot of money. Ah, 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 ah. Whichever level of income you have, if you don't know where your money is going, you can't make good decisions. So control. So wealth creation and stinginess? Not stinginess. Control. Oh, that's the polite word. Okay. It's not polite. <laughs> there is a difference. No. There is a difference between stinginess and control. No. Stinginess means you don't give. Here, what I'm talking about is planned giving. Planned giving. Yeah. So, eh? the third so number two is actually begin to set goals. Like say, this is something that I want to achieve because then you're aiming and you're putting effort behind it. You're strategizing. If this doesn't work, you find another way to get there. If you don't set goals and aim for them, you're going to find yourself in a very difficult position. So set goals. Say, this is where I want to be. And that's, that's something I've seen so many times with people 
Wealthy people, successful people in different places. Think about athletes. I think for athletes, it's the simplest thing, right? Every time I go out, I want to reduce the amount of time it takes me to run 100 meters. So every action they take is to reduce that amount. It's a goal. It's a target. I always laugh because... Uh, Eliud Kipchoge, see, his, do you remember the goal that he had? Mm. It was a specific number. It was one hour, 59 minutes, and 59 seconds. Yes. That's it. Now, because he was able to set that goal, they could work backwards all the way to the starting line, if you remember. And they had a car in front of them with a laser on the ground saying, keep up with this laser, and in two hours from now, you'll have beat your record. But they couldn't do that calculation unless they knew the mm. goal. Mm. Number three, it's a principle that our founder, our Sheikh Ndwati, came up with. And she said this, pay yourself first. Now, again, if all these things sound stingy, I'm sure. That's what you're thinking. No, 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 no. it's okay. <laughs> then carry on. No, mm -hmm. pay yourself first. What does that mean? To pay yourself first means this. When you receive cash, a portion of that amount of money must be saved and invested. And do it first. Why? Because it means you're being serious about that goal that you've set. If you wait until you pay everybody else, there's nothing left. So if you pay the government, then who else do you pay after the government? Your landlord. Then you pay the supermarket. You pay the, who else Black do tax. you pay? Black tax, your relatives. Mm. And relatives are real. Who else do you pay after that? I don't know. Fill the whole list. So the Basad fun, school, all these other things. not paying yourself. No. There's a difference between having fun. So you uh, no. pole is not paying that yourself. That is not paying yourself. But you should budget for it. Actually have a plan for sherehe. So sherehe is different from paying yourself. No. Paying yourself is putting money towards saving and investing. Because that money that you save and invest will actually come back to pay you. Sherehe, you're paying somebody else. You're paying the bar. You're paying whoever it is, the hotel. Mm -hmm. That money is leaving you. What about the fund that was inside you for that duration of time? Good. Give me your fund from last weekend. Sam, <laughs> <laughs> you win. Where is, the money? Where you is your going, fund you going, from last sir, weekend? Sir. <laughs> uh, okay. Now, you you can't. Going. So, pay yourself first. And I mean literally. When money comes in, most of the time you've paid your tax. If you've got a salary, you've paid your tax. If you're a good business person, you've paid your tax as well. Mm. After that, if you're a believer like me, you pay your tithe and offering. The next person you pay is yourself. How do you do that? You save and you invest. And there, you must do both. Whatever is left is what you survive on. That's it. Now, if you try and do this equation and it is not working, it means maybe you're not earning enough. So you need to start thinking, how do I earn more? How do I get more money in my pocket? Mm -hmm. Because, guys, we cannot... I always get bothered by people who come with this idea. Okay, I'm earning 20,000 shillings and I want to own a 5 million shilling house. Stop earning 20,000. Start sure. earning more. How do you do that? So, can I give an example? So please, you know, please, you know, you, and please, come, please. I talk so much. I'm no, sorry. no, 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 please give an example. Because Here's an example. Going... I used to live in an apartment. Eh? The guy who was our security guard, the, the, the Askari, he was earning maybe minimum wage, around 15K, 13, 15K. Okay? Yes. After a few weeks of living there, he just realized, at night I'm just sitting around here doing nothing. Eh? See all these cars, they're here. He started washing guy's cars. At night, you come and park, you even give him the key, he washes. The guy doubled his income. Wow, now I understand wash, wash. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, seriously, he had the time, he had the resource in front of him. Instead of sitting and saying, oh, my boss is not paying me enough, oh, he now said, what else could I do? And he said, now he started washing the cars, that meant now he was taking home 30,000 shillings a month. So Sometimes more than that. Most people uh, find themselves in a place where uh, you've been designated to be a watchman, for example. Yeah. I'm a, a security guard. Mm. But people don't want to see you washing cars because True. during this time, you've been paid for, yes. for this, yes. right? 
Does this mean it only applies when you can, when the job you're doing allows you to exploit an opportunity, uh, an op uh, offers an opportunity to exploit, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when you say stop earning mm -hmm. 20,000 in this context, for yes. the example, stop earning 20,000, yes. are you saying, again, uh, our previous guest, Purity Wakahio, uh -huh. you earn what you deserve? Is this a, is this a complimentary yes. statement to the same? Yes, so become more deserving. Become more deserving. If that's the fact, you earn what you deserve, become more deserving. So here's the argument that I make. Is that, <laughs> I'm talking to young guys because we always talk at universities and different places. I tell people, again, and let me quote Dr. Miles Monroe one more time. He's mm -hmm. one of my favorite writers and speakers of all time. And he said, don't chase after money. He said, chase after value. Because if you're valuable, money will chase after you. Thank you for quoting that because I'll quote you yes. to counter quote what you no say. No problem, go so ahead. But to explain something yes. for us. Uh, um, in your interview uh, on Spice, you mentioned something yeah. about mm -hmm. looking for a job. Yes. Don't look for a job mm -hmm. uh, of a value, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, one of the things you said was mm -hmm. recruitment uh, for a job is very hard. So if you have someone around you giving value, that's the person you give a job and mm -hmm. then you scale up, mm -hmm. right? Is that the new strategy to look for employment? It's not the new one. It's been there for a long time. And... We just really have to, we have to run away from that thought process that I'm just going to get my degree or my diploma, whatever it is, and I'll just go somewhere and I'll hand it in somewhere and people will magically hire me. Okay. That process is not the truth. There is, you have to apply for so many jobs before you get one. Mm -hmm. I mean, we used to talk about it. I don't know. I don't hear many people talking about tamaking. What is tamaking? Do you remember what tamaking was? Yes, yes. Which is you get you get your degree and then you literally are on the road taking okay. your CV everywhere to get some result out of it. And while you're taking your CV everywhere, you're talking to your networks around you. So there's... Let me, let me explain what happens, yeah? So we have this thought that I am in school... Then after, after school, I'll get a job. No. Get a job now. When I talk to young people in, in university, get a job now. Even if that job is not paying you, what is it giving you? Experience. And this is something that happens around the world. If you go to universities and high schools around the world, by the grace of God, I had an opportunity to study outside of, of Kenya. And where I was, when I was in university, I got a job. The people I was working with were teenagers. They were in high school. But they would finish high school, they'd finish uh, their schoolwork, and then they work for two hours every day. Which country is this that practices child labor? <laughs> <laughs> because that's what we view it as. We view uh, Around children, yeah. the world. If you think about it, when you think about a McDonald's employee, what do you think? Are they old? Mm -hmm. They are normally youth. They are teenagers. They're in campus. What does that mean? By the time you leave campus, you already have over four years experience at work. Okay. But for some reason here in our country, I'm in campus, I'm in campus, that's it. I'm studying. Yeah, so get the, some experience somewhere. So two things come up yes. from that conversation. <laughs> Number one, yes. uh, pride is the, the stumbling block between young people and gathering experience. Technically, and then number two, um, we go about employment the wrong way. Mm -hmm. It has always been create employment for yourself in someone else's business. Yeah. I mean, and literally do that. What does that mean? If there's opportunities for even an internship or even just to volunteer, go. And when you volunteer, give it your all. So that you when can... you leave that place, they're like, I want that guy back. Do you know you can give your all yes. and it ends up like a bad relationship? Can, yeah. You can give your all for 10 years. Okay. Do obviously do, <laughs> obviously do it with some wisdom. Obviously say there must be an outcome. There's a goal. And make that clear. Like for instance, my first job, I was an unpaid intern. Hey, with a university degree. Mm -hmm. But I went into that place. I said, I want to work for you. For free. I want to work for you. 
but I'm willing to work for free so that you see what I'm worth. Do you see there's a difference between that statement? I want to work from you. Then you have the discussion. Then, but I'm willing to work for a period of time so that you see what I'm worth. Okay. That's it. I worked two months for nothing. Nobody trusts your CV. I'm telling you, I worked two months for nothing. After that, I started, it, what was I earning? University degree, I was earning 18,000 bob gross. 18,000 bob gross. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Three years after that, I was a head of department. That was my entry into the job. Okay. But many people want, I want the 100,000 shillings today. Mm. No. It takes time. Go through the process. Get that experience. If you can get it as early as possible, do so. Okay. But, um, yeah, there's a, we have to change that thought process. Offer value. Okay. Yeah. I'm very interested in discussing <laughs> the business environment. But before that, mm -hmm. please help us uh, break down the concept of uh, when, when someone fails to get a job, yeah. they talk about simifungulie uh, biashara. Fungulie ule biashara. Do we have people who succeed from that? Atio, open a kinyozi for me. Eh, open a cyber for me. Yeah. You know, the idea of, what do you think of that concept in itself? Yeah. Is it possible to succeed? Yes. It's as simple as that. But who is that person who is going to take an opportunity that has been given and make it worth it? It's all about opportunities, and opportunities come all the time. Every day there's a new opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's just who is willing to take that opportunity and maximize okay. on it. Um, I think we just have to, we really have to change this, this thought process around that, that you cannot start small and grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can. You can. And Sour. it takes time. Sour. Can I say something about Please. that starting small? Mm. Even all these, you know, I know many people are watching this and they're looking at you and they're wondering, you look so good, the set, everything. And if, do they know how many hours you've put into this? Like, uh, you, I'm yeah. sure. Have you ever told people the story of the gigs you used to do before you got the, the TV show, before you got all those things? Mm. See, it was whoever calls you, you show up. Yes, yes. How many years have you been doing this, this gig? Years. Hey, did you hear that? <laughs> uh -huh, yeah. Dr. Kingori didn't become Dr. Kingori overnight. Mm. This is 14 years yeah. of experience, hard work. Was it all smooth? Mm, no. Were there days you thought this is I might not make it? I have a recollection of my desperate moments. Vivid actually. Are you still here? By the grace of God. Yes. But you had to put in the effort. And I think there's a sense in which people look at, you know, over, this idea of overnight success. It doesn't happen. Someone can't watch this video and then they become a success tomorrow because they've seen what you've done. It is impossible. Why? Because you have to put in the effort. So that when you see like a young guy, you know, all these people, suddenly your music hits. Go and talk to those people about those who, who successfully done music for a lifetime. Not just a one hit wonder. I'm talking about musicians. They've done music for years. You ha can't be suddenly the greatest athlete in the world. It took time for you to do. You can't open a business and in the next two months, you're the greatest business owner in the world. No, it took time. It takes process. And I think that's the thing that we've lost. But the best part of it is when you enjoy the process. Mm -hmm. Ah, I enjoy it. I came early so I could sit here and watch people doing their thing. I saw your sound guy came, he set everything up, he had yeah. to be ready. I saw the camera guys, they did the light. There's, mm. a, there's an enjoyment that comes. You know, that's the purpose. Yeah. In fact, many times the joy and the fulfillment in life is not actually even the achieving of the goal, but the process the towards process. that goal. Yes, yes, yes. And we have to begin to enjoy that process. Wow. Mm -hmm. In fact, when you talk about process, there are musicians. I've never talked about this publicly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are people I watched mm -hmm. uh, doing shows, Ilea, Uomba Nafasi to perform. Yes. And once, all of a sudden, Unaskia. In fact, three people. Yeah. Number one, I saw Otile Brown selling shoes at the National Theatre. And I, I first heard a song. Yeah. I love this song in mm -hmm. 2015. I hear this song. Mm -hmm. And it's, it was Deja Vu. Mm -hmm. I hear this song. Over, over and over again. And then I waited for the presenter to mention who yeah. this person is. And I had saved his phone mm -hmm. number mm -hmm. on my phone as Otile Njumu, because <laughs> he had tried to sell me some, a, a pair of shoes. Uh, shoes. Yeah. And I remember, and, and then I called him. I'm like, 
Could you be the one yeah. behind? Yeah. Yeah. He's one of the biggest artists in the country right now. I, we have a um, Hat the Band. Hat yes. the Band used to come uh, at the theater shows. Yeah. Uh, I used to do intermissions, stand up comedy intermissions. They yeah. used to come and uh, get a spot mm -hmm. to perform just to showcase their talent. Yeah. Some of the big, uh, one of the biggest bands in the country right now. Now, this one I've never told even members of my team. Tell them. In 2011, we were part of a government training, yeah, film and theater production. Yeah. Uh, part of our team, I believe, there was a, a, a group of boys. Was it two boys mm -hmm. or Nini? Mm -hmm. And I remember they performed, they may have performed in a National Talent Academy gig mm -hmm. in 2011. Yeah. Like one or two could practice mm -hmm. where, where you're part of the training. Mm -hmm. Uh, my lady, uh, someone, Anakuja uh, hey, Niaji, this is my favorite song. Guess from who? The biggest team right now. And remember mm. my interaction with them, 2011. Yeah. 2011 to date. But I'm because people had never heard of them before, they think it just happened like this. It doesn't. Uh, we had, uh, what is her name? Tichawanjiko. She spoke at one of our events. Mm. And she tells of when she started doing her performance art. Same story. She would go to Gikomba, buy clothes, go and sell. And then in the evening, she packs them and goes for practice at, in town, Alliance, and does performances there. Mm. There is nobody who just suddenly broke out like this. It mm. took time. But it's that consistency, that effort, that time. I want something out of this that brings them into that same space. And can you want something and never get it? Yes. And how do you know that however bad you want it, you'll never get it? I think if you have good friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've done that to people. <laughs> I'm driving now, I'm coming back to you. I'm going to you It's the same for business. It's the same. Now success in any I think industry. If you have a good community around you, they'll tell you the truth. Like it's important. It's important for somebody to tell you, maybe this is not your thing. But, but there is also a thin line between that because yes. people may doubt you. Yes. They may give you the wrong feedback. Yes. But you eventually make it. That's true. Then how do you identify the right voice? Again, by the grace of God. I wish there were, you know, I wish there was a rule, a formula book in which you could take this book and say, if you follow every single principle in this book, suddenly you will become whatever it is that you feel. There isn't. But I, th I honestly believe that God has placed a gift in each one of us that is unique, that nobody else can be able to touch you on that level. Mm. And if you search for it enough, you will discover it. Mm. And the best thing is that if you have people around you who love you and mm -hmm. who actually care about you, mm -hmm. who are not just your cheerleaders, uh, 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 they are real with you. Because you don't your want just to call haters. Uh, <laughs> not haters, they are real with you. That they'll give you honest feedback. Mm -hmm. And be able to say, hey, King Ori, I think uh, you could have done this better. Mm. I think that show was not criticism. good. And when you do well, they cheer for you. Keep doing the same thing. That's the power of community around you. Because if you don't have that, you don't have a sense of your position. Like you, you can't really know the reality. And it's one of the worst things when people are doing their, the thing they're not meant to be doing. Mm. Mm. That's mm. a horrible thing. Because then you're not you will never fully experience that success that you're looking for. Okay. Mm. okay. Oh, and by the way, just for clarification, I didn't manage to buy the shoes from T.D. <laughs> Brown. I look one of them by your time, and uh, I think I was uh, in Akala class. Akala, for people who know Akala. I promised to buy them, by the way. Ali Omoka before. He left the business before I could buy. Now, uh, I'm Take like him to... for lunch one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> But you've said I need to save money. Yes, yes plan to, to take him for even lunch is in the plan. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll budget for it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'd like to quote Bishop uh, Julian Kuehler for you. Uh -huh, yes. uh, in something, uh, I, I, I admire his experience mm -hmm. uh, in entrepreneurship, what he's gone through, yep. his ups and downs. Yeah. But something he's saying, that Kenya is a very hostile business environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. In terms of access to debt, Mm -hmm. And uh, we, I, I'd like us to tie this to predatory lending, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, just access to money mm -hmm. does not mean that uh, 
does not mean, like let's say, you can access money from microfinance, mm -hmm. but when I link this with uh, something I got from my first money teacher, mm -hmm. uh, Gor Semelango, who has been a guest on one mm -hmm. of our episodes, mm -hmm. uh, he, he planted something in my head. He told me that in the Kenyan environment, to some extent, the most realistic um, return on investment is 5%. Mm -hmm. So why are you going to get the money to pay a loan back at 30%, right? So I carried that for a long time. And mm -hmm. when I started doing the mathematics, uh, most businesses on average, and I think I brought this up with uh, uh, Piriti Wakahio and Joram Dongo mm -hmm. uh, in our previous episode again, Wherever, whatever you do, profit is not measured in a month. So uh, when you spread Annual across, waste, yeah. on average, mm -hmm. you play around 8 to 14 percent. Mm -hmm. 8 to 14 percent, realistic. For the most part, 10 mm -hmm. on average, right? Mm -hmm. Where are you getting the 30 percent times 12 to pay a microfinance? Mm -hmm. in, or, because that's, uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's 360 percent, uh, assuming you borrow the same and keep repaying yeah, yeah. at the end of the year, right? Yeah. Why are you getting the money to pay 360%, whereas the realistic return is around an average of eight? That means the business is unsustainable, right? Mm -hmm. Please take us through hostile business environment, what it means, mm -hmm. how it affects businesses, for beginners, how to navigate, mm -hmm. and uh, access to capital and debt. <laughs> how many hours do you have at the moment? We have time. <laughs> Ah, okay. You've raised many issues. Yes. Let's break them down. Yes. So, generally in business, debt is not the best source of capital, especially for startup. If you've ever heard of a speaker, he's come to Kenya a couple of times, Vusi Tembekwai. Yes, yes, yes. He talked about this in one of his speeches, and I thought it was, it was vital for us to understand. Starting a business requires a, a certain type of capital. And he called it patient capital. Patient capital means that people give you cash mm -hmm. that they're not expecting you to pay back as quickly as possible. That's the best kind of capital, especially at the start of a business. Yes. You'll find that, that in many of the developed countries around the world, they have infrastructure for that kind of patient capital. And it's, they're saying, you know, we're going to invest in your business. It's going to stay for a while. Mm -hmm. And we know it's not going to start paying back for a period of time. So yes. that's one of the elements that we need to have. But the issue that we are facing here is also a lack of knowledge as to how business, businesses are financed and how you repay financing. So in your example, I was not 100% sure whether I got what you meant in mm -hmm. that you're saying that my business is only able to be profitable at somewhere around 10%, but the loans that I'm getting in order to run this business can cost more than that 10% in terms of repayment. Did they get that right? Yes, yes, okay. yes. So that's not necessarily an issue because you're not often, generally you're not paying debt from profit. You're not paying debt from profit. Yes. Uh -huh. Debt usually shows up as a cost in your profit and loss. Let me explain what that means. If you're setting up repayment of debt, it's actually a monthly repayment that you're putting in there. Mm -hmm. And so that's a cost item, not after profit has been calculated. Okay. So that's where the issue comes in. So if you can... 20, 20 for the Okay. Ah, yeah. I wish You've I had borrowed? my spreadsheet over here to open uh, for guys so that you can uh, see. Uh, we have... Um, I don't yeah. know why we forgot to uh, bring our whiteboard. <laughs> uh, we have... Yes. You, you have you have borrowed twenty thousand. Yes, you're supposed to pay this twenty thousand. But you're supposed to invest this twenty thousand back uh -huh. uh, within the month, and you've been given this twenty thousand at thirty percent. Yes, uh, interest per month. Yes, not per year. So why is it at that level? Because you're 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 borrowing a small amount of money, and it is high risk. That's why they are charging you thirty percent. Because at that level, if somebody is willing to give you 20,000 and you're going to try and do business, they're saying the likelihood of you defaulting is very high. That's, mm. that's essentially what they're saying. Mm. That's why it costs so much. But when they have security and they know you're likely to pay back, then the cost of debt reduces. Also, the length of time also reduces that cost. Okay. 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 So you have to now begin to think through what is the process by which you're going to get, that, get the result. If the 20,000 from the microfinance, you cannot be able to make that back from the gross margins that you have, 
plus the other costs that you have, then don't borrow from there. You have to do the mathematics before you make the investment or you do the borrowing. And that's the mistake that we often make, is that we've not done the maths to know whether we have the result. So let me explain what I mean, mm -hmm. in, as simple as possible. So here's how we think about business. I go, hey, in fact, I even know somebody in China. No, let's even talk China, let's talk Gikomba. I go to Gikomba, I buy a bill, right? And that bill costs me, let's say, that 20,000 more. Yes. So the thought process is, if I sell now, what, what do you think people are aiming to sell that whole bill for? Mm. What is the aim that they are? 60,000. So I'm going to take this uh, 20,000 and we're going to sell for 60,000. Yes. Okay, which means three times what you've, what you've paid for it. Yes. Okay, fine. What does that mean now? Mm -hmm. You have only taken into account the gross margins that we're the talking. The gross about. margins. Yes. Yes, yes. Or gross profit. Yes. So if I buy a pair of shoes for 2,000 shillings and I sell that same pair of shoes for 4,000 shillings, yes. I have not made profit. That 2,000 extra is not profit. That 2,000 extra is called gross profit. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it only takes into account the cost, the direct cost of the shoe itself. Mm -hmm. But in business, was the only cost the shoe? Okay. No. I had to go find the shoe. So there was transport to go and find that shoe. There was transport to deliver it to your house. That cost, where did it go? Who thought about getting that shoe? Who actually got the shoe? Who bought the shoe? Who selected the shoe? Who found the customer? Who sold that shoe? Who accounted and received the payment for that shoe? Mm. Me. Am I free? No. That is called labor. And in a business, if you don't account for labor, mm -hmm. you're not in business because that was a cost that somebody had to do the work. Mm -hmm. Let's take it further than that. Where were you working from? Mm. Where I was working from? Yes, to buy those shoes. Okay, Where okay, yes, yes, yes. There was a space in which work happened. If you don't account for the cost of that space, you're not in business. Hey, did you use your phone for any of these transactions? Mm -hmm. That's a utility cost. Mm -hmm. Did you use electricity? Mm -hmm. Did you use water? In business, it is not simply the cost of the goods the difference, now you have money. You're not in business. If you're in yeah. that, you're, you're in survival. So you're self-employed. If I'm getting you correct, yes. if I'm going to buy a shoe in Gikomba, yes. I've seen a plug. This shoe is 2,000 shillings. Yes. I'm going to sell it at 4,000 shillings. Yes. If I stop, I, I count the fare. It yes. goes to my touch. Yes. But I get thirsty. Apa kwa barabara, and you buy I buy soda. Na iweka kwa kiatu. Yes. Uh, if I am going to call this guy, I buy whatever I spend on. Nikienda nipate mutu wale wa kusimama kwa traffic. Yes. Ni muachie mukate. Yes. Iyo mukate, naweka kwa kiatu. Anything I spend between me and that shoe. Now you're talking business. If you're talking survival, and that's the thing about many people who say I'm in business here, are in survival or self-employment. They're not in business. There's a difference between self-employment and business. Yes. I thought people were being, uh, as in everyone is advocating for people to be self-employed. So that's advocating for the wrong thing. I'm a we self want people to be entrepreneurs, to be business owners. Not self-employed. Not self-employed. Because in being a business owner, that's where you're generating the most value and it stops being about just you. When you're self-employed, when you don't show up to work, there's no money. When you're an entrepreneur and you own a business, whether you show up to work or not, it generates money. Now, can you raise funds? Can you raise the capital to start a business by doing that kind of work, being self-employed? Yes, and many people have. But the problem is many people remain self-employed. They never break through into being a business owner. Now, here's the other thing that is a problem. Let me just be very clear. You know, you can make a lot of money being self-employed. A lot. Mm -hmm. Think about doctors and lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. Professional. Mm -hmm. If you're a really good doctor and you have a clinic, people will pay you a lot of money. 
Mm-hmm. Okay? Yes. But here's the thing. If you, if you don't show up to the clinic for two months, is there any money? Now, there are people who own hospitals. Now, in a hospital, do you care which doctor you see? So long as there is a doctor who is present, people will keep coming to that hospital. There's a difference between that clinic where the doctor is the only value and a hospital where multiple doctors are the value in that. Okay. This is a business. This is self-employment. So if your business cannot function without you, or you are not heading in that direction, then you're not in business. Hmm. <laughs> so so um, does it mean... Yes. Okay, I may, may get. Mm-hmm. I got that. So now break down a business environment for us. Okay. So you we, said Kenya does, not, Kenya does not have patient capital, right? It, well, we don't have a big infrastructure for that. Okay. Like, I mean, like, if you go to the US, they have like literally companies that are venture capital firms, angel investing firms. I mean, like all these at different levels, they are organizations that are ready to put money into high potential businesses. Now, here's the good thing. Let me just say before I talk about that. Now we have a global economy. So that means that that money that is there is willing to come here, by the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've seen, haven't you ever been surprised when you read in the newspaper, oh, this company has suddenly raised 3 billion shillings in funding. Kenyan company. Mm -hmm. That means you have access to the same infrastructure. It's just harder for us on this side to prove it's not, it's not as easy simply because of the borders, simply because of networks and all those things. But is the money available? Yes. It's just harder. If you want to really understand what it means to be in a, what's the terminology used about the business environment? A hostile, hostile business environment is, is a business environment that's not fair. That's where, mm-hmm. that's where the issues would come up. Okay. And it's a tough thing because it's, think about it this way, right? Now I'm going, no, it's important that people hear the truth. Let's talk about it this way. If I own a sporting goods shop, right? And I get a license, let's say from any one of these big brands that are out there, everybody likes, you know, those sports brands, name them Nike, Reebok, whatever, all those different. I get a license from them. Mm -hmm. I import their products, original products, and they cost me maybe $100 a pair of shoes, let's say as an example, 100 mm-hmm. pairs. I have to charge more than that $100 in order for me to get a return on my business. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, somebody goes to China, because that's where it comes from. I have nothing, I, get, I mean, that's, we all know. All original and even the fake stuff, you'll find it in China. It's just the, dev- the level that you're going to. Somebody goes and gets a bootleg, Mm. Same pair of shoes that cost them, as I said, 2,000 bob. Mm -hmm. I imported mine at $100. This one imported at 2,000. But when I go on Instagram, they look exactly the same. In fact, they might even be the same. 2,000 Kenya shillings. 2,000 shillings. So uh, $100 is, let's say, uh, 13,000 shillings now? About that, yes, 13,000. And this one gets for 2,000. 2,000. Okay. Yes. Haven't you ever wondered? You go to the shops, go to a shopping mall, mm. and you'll see the same shoe you saw on Instagram for 4,000, yes. they're selling there for 15,000, 20,000 shoes. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Is mm-hmm. that fair? Okay, fair in that, I understand what you mean, Yes. but I, I would like to know, mm. like fair in terms of this person caters for the, the market that can afford, or fair in terms of the market is not regulated to protect the person importing at $100. That's right. So that's an issue. It is a real issue. Because it means there is a level of lack of fairness. Let's take it further than that. Because I have a shop, (laughs) because I have a shop, the government can see me. The government can see you? Yes. There's an example, Mm -hmm. like in terms of regulating, to protect the person who imports at $100. This is like the example uh, uh, in a meme that goes around where yes. people talk about, mm-hmm. uh, like, who Jeff Koinange, Mkoshu Akifinyo Vizuri, Haezi Ongea Poa. As in, does this mean in, in terms of purchasing power? <laughs> in terms of, in terms of, um, yes. It, yeah, in terms of purchasing, right? Yes. Does it mean that if, you, if this person who imports a shoe to sell mm-hmm. at 13,000, if he's protected, 
that this person who buys at 2,000 does not have access to the market, mm -hmm. people will be forced to buy at that amount. Um, this is the, the person who buys at 2,000 understands yeah. the market, what the market can afford. So here's the question. Mm. If, if, I, if I found a guy who looks like you, who's yes. a bit funny, <laughs> you see, and now, <laughs> and now I, I start another show. Now instead of Dr. Kingori, it's, it's Prophet Kingori. Uh -huh. How would you feel about that? Hmm. Like what, what would that do to you? Yeah, oh. yeah I get it. Because you've built up this whole ecosystem around you, wonderful production and all those kind of things. Mm. So when you now are doing things that are not original, mm. what does that mean? But, but, that's the environment that you're in. Mm. Are people able to make money? Yes. Mm. So as, as entrepreneurs, you find a solution for the environment that you're in. The best kind of environment is one that is fair. Everyone mm -hmm. understands these are the levels that you're going to be competing at. Compete fairly. When there's a lack of fair competition, then there's issues. Because on one side, you have access to credit. Like, that's what I'm saying. At these other guys don't have access to credit. So the guy who was, who's selling the $100 shoes, a bank is more likely to lend him than the guy who's selling 2,000 shoes. Is that fair? No. So there, those inequalities in the market are what I believe make it a hostile environment. And then if there's a lack of regulation and things like that, that becomes what makes it difficult for that to happen. Mm. Then the issue of access to credit and, and to investment money, as I talked about the patient money, that's the other effect that is there. But remove all those issues. Our problem in this country and across Africa, because we've trained in Africa, I've been to north, south, east, west. Mm. We have the same issue. We have poor education on how business works. There's a difference between how money works and how business works. How business works is a different equation. So that thought process, that's what I was trying to say. If I sell that pair of shoes, let's talk about even the ones from Ikomba. If I sell that pair of shoes that I bought for 2000 for 4000 I have not made 2000 shillings because I have failed to account for all the other costs in my business of selling that shoe. And mm. that's where the difference is. When I account for all those other costs, if I account for them, including myself, because I'm the one who's there, am I worth 2000 Bob? No. Is that person who's selling 2000 shoes worth 2000 Bob worth 2000? No. So you value yourself at that point and say, what is the cost of my time every month? And the cost of my time, if I were to be hired somewhere, is let's say, let's even say 20,000 shillings. So if I only sell one pair of shoes, I have not made 20,000. I have lost, oops, did I drop something? The microphone. It is the micro, but it has been held, well done, by whatever is there. Ah, okay. You have not I have made not 20, made 20,000. 20, I have lost 18,000. No, I've not made 2,000. I have lost 18,000 shillings. If you don't meet if your target. If I don't target. meet the target. Because there was this cost called Waidaka, who is valued at 20,000 shillings a month. That's my value. Okay. So when you begin to actually value the things that you have, the cost of the production, the cost of sales, then you are in business. Before that, you're self-employed. And I know this because that's where I used to be. I, was, I told you, my first business was a production company like what you guys are doing here. Mm. This is how I, like, I used to do the mathematics. Mm -hmm. You'd say, good, I know everybody here. Today they're here to shoot and all. I will pay everybody 5,000, 5,000, 5,000, 10K, depending on their, their need. So you do that total. Then you say, okay, for the company that I'm, I'm produ producing this for, I will charge them. The total for my production is 50,000. I will charge them 100,000. Then made. I pay everybody 50. Mm -hmm. I have made, made how 50. much? 50. No. I haven't made 50. Where was I thinking about this idea? Was I in a space somewhere? Mm -hmm. Did I account for that space? No. no. Mm -hmm. I was in, had equipment costs, had transport costs. Hey, I am a cost to my business. 
And my value is not 50K. Put in the value that is yours. And then when you actually put those numbers for your business, you begin to see whether you're profitable or you're simply self-employed. And my argument is I was self-employed. Self-employed to the point that, hey, I did a gig. <laughs> I sold a, a, a show to the television station. We were not even paid in shillings. We were paid in dollars. Ow. Hey, now I said, where are dollars spent? <laughs> They're not spent locally here. Yeah, yes, where yes. do we go? Mm. Went, got on a plane and went to the U.S. to spend the dollars. Because yes. I had no we went to clue. Look for the dollar market. Mm. I had no clue. You know, I was saying I'm going to buy equipment, what, 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 all those different things. No, I had no clue that the money I had just made from that good deal could have taken my business, run that business for eight months. But I went in one month and spent it all on new equipment that my clients didn't need. My clients were not asking for new equipment. What did they want? A good production. Do they care what equipment you're using? What do they want? Good production. Okay. But because I had been in this cycle of self-employment, I did not about I did not understand cash flow cycles. I didn't understand that making a difference between the cost of production and the sales price is simply called a gross margin or gross profit. I had never fully worked out what profitability looked like in my business. Please explain to us what is um, cash flow. What did you call it? Cash, cash flow, flow management. No, no, there's yes. something. There's something you said. Cash flow cycles. Yes. What's cash flow cycles? Cash flow cycles means just because you have made a sale does not mean that you, you have actually actualized the money. So people get shocked, especially when you're in businesses where you have this thing called credit terms. You've said you've provided the service or you've provided the product, and especially for larger companies, they say they'll pay you when? After 30, 90 days. 30 to 90 days. Mm. So what do you do? from the point at which you have sold the product to the point at which you get paid. That's the cash flow cycle. So when we start talking about cash flow cycles, it's a, it's a simple principle. It's only we've never practiced it. Before we came on air, you were asking about a culture of, of, of business. If you're not around it, it's very difficult for somebody to be able to see because we get shocked by numbers. That mm -hmm. was me. We, hey, 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 you have been paid in dollars. They are like, I have all the money. You don't. That should take you for many years. So it starts off with very simple principle. That's why we're in business at Centonomy. We are trying to help people to understand the simple principle that is going to multiply your potential. Mm. So a simple principle is this. If when I sell one pair of shoes, I make 2,000 gross margin, but all the other costs in my business, including me, because I'm a cost, I should be paid every month for the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. If all my other costs are 20,000 shillings, whatever number it is, then it now tells me I cannot survive in business selling one pair of shoes a month. Mm -hmm. So how many shoes do I need to, to sell? Then you say, okay, to make 20,000. See, that's the 20,000 number. That If I sell one pair of shoes, I make 2,000. So how many pairs of shoes must I sell? Mm, 10. 10. That's gross. 10. Watch this. At 10, I have made a gross margin of 20. Yes. All my other costs in that business are 20. 20 minus 20 is what? That's breaking even. That is zero. That is called the break-even point of your business. Okay. That's it. Break-even is you look busy, but you're making nothing. Break? No. Here's the, here's the issue. If I don't put myself as a cost in my business, then if I, you are not even breaking even because you're not even breaking even because you have, there's one major labor cost that you have failed to account for. And in, in any economy, that's called slave labor. It is illegal even for you to be a slave in your own business. Hmm. Why, are you being a, why are you doing work for nothing? No, you work for something. So put yourself as a cost there. Yes. Now, same example. See, my cost for my time is there. 20,000, all my other costs are 20. That's the break-even point of a business. When a business has not made a profit, but neither, praise the Lord, has it made a loss. It's a very important point. So now that you know that, what will you do? What, as a business owner, what would you do? Scale up. Sell more. Shoes. 
Those are called targets. So if you're running a business that does not have targets, my Zaka was number one, then you're not in business. Because targets are informed by the profit you want to make. So, if you have set a target so that you make more than, what, than the cost of running your business, then you are in profit. So mm -hmm. here are the rules. Can I give you the rules of business? Please do. Ay, ay, ay. <laughs> Rule number one of business, and this is different from any other enterprise, whether you're NGO, church, all these different, is that the aim of every business is to generate and maximize profit. That is the aim. Generate and maximize profit. Generate, which is to make, but not just to make, but to do what? Maximize. maximize. So with the resources that I have, how can I maximize profit? Because you have limited resources. You don't have infinite resources. But with what I have, how can I maximize? Then rule number two. And this one is hard for us to hear, but let's hear it. Profit is not your money. If you're an entrepreneur, profit is not your money. But I worked for it. It no, is my idea. You worked for your salary. That's one way you get money from it your business. It is my idea. Uh, I came uh, up with it. My brother, here, you see, this is the mistake we make. Profit is not your money. In business, there are only three ways that you get money from your business. Number one, a salary. I have started the company. Yes. Right? I have opened the account. Correct. I have come up with the ideas for the profit. Correct. I have paid myself 200,000, yes. let's say for example, and As a um, salary. there is a balance of 800,000 in my account. Very From good. my ideas. It's not your money. From my ideas. Can Whose I give, money is it? Can I give you number two? You see, you're getting ahead. Number one is what? Salary or wage. So wages are hourly rates, salary is monthly. Okay? Mm -hmm. Salary or wages are your money for the time and effort that you put in. Get mm -hmm. paid. And that's a cost to the business. Number two is a different word. And that's why people have to hear it. It is not called profit. It is called dividend. Dividend is not the same thing as profit. Dividend is a portion of the net profit at the end of a financial year. Not profit, a portion of the net. When you hear all these companies declaring their profits in the newspaper, do they give it all out as dividend? Mm -hmm. Why? They don't give it all out as dividend because how are you going to reinvest in that business? How are you going to manage cash flows in your business when the months where the money coming in is less than the money going out? But, but does not mean that after I pay myself a salary yes. from my ideas, yes. I can be arrested for spending the money that you came from my ideas. You will not be arrested, ideas. but your business will not function if you take money out of the business prematurely or out of order. That money is not yours. Profit belongs to the business. Dividend is the portion of profit that you as a business owner pay yourself based on your plan. Mm -hmm. So. That's number two. Mm -hmm. So not profit. In fact, that's rule number two. Profit is not your money. Okay. Profit, rule number one was what? In business is to generate, make, and maximize. and maximize profit. That's the rule. But profit is not your money. So you need to know how to get money out of your business. You either pay yourself a salary or a wage. Number two, dividend, which is a portion of the net profit. When? At the end of a financial year. Not every month. So before you move on to the next point, yes. there is nothing unethical when yes. we go to the principle of maximizing, yes. generating and maximizing profit. Uh -huh. There is nothing un unethical mm -hmm. about a hawker selling you something from yes. 3,000 shillings and you bargain to 80 bob. No, why? Why would it be unethical? So the hawker is the one who needs to know what is the least amount I can sell this product. Because if you're selling it for less than what you bought it, then you're not in business again. So in business, there's nothing like kukongwa being hit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're saying. It's what you decide to pay. If somebody sells it to you, they have chosen to sell it to you. Mm -hmm. So bargain. Now, we are both believers here. 
can you be kind to people? And you know, for that person, why am I bargaining on something that I can help somebody out with? Help them if you can help. Do you get what I'm saying? But if somebody is in need, me, I'm in need, you're also in need. I can bargain with you. So let's not lose the track. No problem. Apple kwa bargaining, tena is a whole other conversation, but endelea. Number three. This is now where you see business owners suddenly become ridiculously rich. Ridiculous, generally, if you have a good business idea. is when you sell shares in your business. Okay. Kevin Ashley, one of the founders of Nairobi Java House, now Java House, right? He, we don't know how much they sold their, the business the first time. Mm. But the first time they sold, and all, pretty much all the other shareholders left. He was left by himself mm. with 10% of that business. They kept him, I believe, for you know, to help with the growth factor. That's what the investor said. You stay with your 10%, but stay in the business so you can continue to build. So we don't know how much he made that time. Mm. But the next time the business was sold, we know how much he made. It was even in the business daily. Mm -hmm. The Abraj Group, I believe, that's the investment company, bought Nairobi Java House at that time for 13 billion shillings. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kevin Ashley owned how much of that business? 10%. 10%. How much cash did he go home with? 1.3 billion. So when you scale your business, uh, uh, when it's a good idea, yes. going public is a good idea. Selling, your, it doesn't have to go public. Going public means or you go selling. to an IPO. But selling, selling shares in your business is usually where you see entrepreneurs mm -hmm. significantly grow their wealth. Because they have built value. Other investors are saying, I want a piece of that. And, and they're willing one? to pay. And that money, now that they pay to buy shares in your business, goes in your pocket. So it's 1.3 billion. You go and start the card. Unangalia, you see 1.3 billion. Yes. We have people who have like, because I understand wealth is in different, and this is a whole different conversation of portfolio. Yeah. We have someone who can an end a ATM and the zeros have no end. Yes. You can't see the last one. Dot, 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 you know. At this stage, are you allowed to spend the way you want? Again. You think it's hard to, send, to spend a billion shillings? Not hard. Huh. Do you ever see that video? It's the one that really shocked me. I, I say it all the time because it shocked me. Mm -hmm. you, you know the boxer? What's his name? Floyd Mayweather. Yes. Yes. So he's on a podcast. And the guy who's interviewing him looks at his watch. And he's like, hey, Floyd Banner. Because it's diamond encrusted. They say, hey, Floyd, I can see you have a nice watch. How much is that watch? $18 million. Mm -hmm. His watch. But why would you have a watch that you can only wear on an internet? Because for one, no. This... <laughs> <laughs> Do you think no. you can enjoy a, at a watch at 2000 no, that watch, and walk No, through. the $18 million watch for Floyd Mayweather is, is an investment. In fact, it will become, because he has worn it, because it's his, it now becomes worth more than the $18 million. Yeah, we had that conversation with Jimmy Wanjigi in yeah. terms of like how people store well. Yeah. But if you like, let's say you leave the country in an emergency, you yes. have, you can spend. Yes. Okay. That's an asset to him. So that's how easy it is to spend a billion. Um, that's a billion shilling, more than a billion shilling on one item. Mm. So when you talk about, can you just spend it like that? No. And that's the, one of the principles of wealth we talked about. If you are out of control, you cannot build wealth. That's the reason. When you look at all these lists of the wealthiest people in the world, do you ever see a lottery winner there? No. Why? Because lottery winners have not built the skill to manage money. In fact, many lottery winners, like, and they win millions of dollars, die poor, because mm -hmm. they never understood how to manage money. God Semelango says money has a process and a pattern. That's too well. Yeah, that's it. You can repeat it. That's it. Oh. <laughs> that was number three, mm -hmm. uh, sell a, a good idea that can yep. be sold. You have to do it. That's where you see people actually earning money from their business. So salary or a wage, 
dividend, which is a portion of the net profit at the end of a financial year. And number three is when you sell shares in your business. In fact, that's what the whole business infrastructure like in the US is all about. Many of those companies, they have been sold multiple times because people continuously see value and are able to build on to that. There's a difference between selling shares in your business and selling your business. Yeah. In this case, there's always, uh, this, I've asked myself a question, this question very many times. Mm -hmm. uh, someone is selling you a butchery, mm -hmm. the prime location. Yeah. Why are you selling something that makes you money? Because you want more money. So you're, it's making you money already. Yes. So I have another investment plan or another goal that I have for myself. Why not? Oh, so it's not always a trick. No. <laughs> for someone to sell you a burden. <laughs> it can be. Mm. But you do your, that's matters. what the idea called due diligence. Go and investigate. Why is this person selling that business? Mm. Is it making money? Actually look at the books. Ask for the profit and loss for that business. Income statement. What does it look like? If it's making money, it's a business. Buy it if you're interested in that business. So um, when you talk of a um, hostile business environment, and you gave us a very good example of someone selling shoes, yeah. the same type of shoes, uh, going for a uh, hundred dollars, thirteen thousand shillings. Mm -hmm. Another same pair of shoe uh, of Tropizo uh, calls them Makasu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, going for two thousand shillings yeah. in a hostile business environment. Should you approach mm -hmm. with hostility, peer? Like, don't go. Um, as in, it, it, it's like fighting with pigs. Enter like a pig. Like enter the market like a pig. Don't go um, at investing in the, the elite business. Me, I want to do business clean when yeah. other people are doing dirty. Yeah. Uh, is that a rule that should be followed? No. Because, because it shouldn't. Mm. So how can you survive? Uh, by the grace alone. Because by the grace of God. Here's the thing. If you're doing, no matter what, if you're doing something shady, if you're doing something wrong in your business, it will be discovered. It yeah. will be. Like there's a limit to how far that business can be able to go. Like a business that's not paying tax. Like, for example, there are many businesses in Kenya that don't pay tax. Yes. Many businesses. Mm -hmm. So if you're not paying tax, there is a ceiling to how far you can go. Because the moment you go and try and do business now at a larger scale, let's say with one of the large corporations or with government, what are you going to be asked for? Mm. Your, your tax certification, isn't it? Your tax, your... I forget, ah, where has the term left my head? But compliance. yes, compliance, that's yes. the word. You'll be asked for that. And if you ask, immediately you can't do that business. So there's a limit to where you can be able to. So do business right. So that's where yeah. regulation comes in. That's right. So when you talk about that, when, when you talk about a hostile environment, it's an issue of funding. So that's one of the problems. Debt, that's one of the problems. But also just fairness in the market. So it was not just about that you're able to sell a ch cheaper shoe, but also that guy who's selling the cheaper shoe doesn't have access to the same kind of resources that the other guy does. So there's an imbalance there as well. Okay. So that's what I would consider to be a hostile business environment. Okay. Also all the regulations. But here, hey, listen, I know we talk a lot about government and how they what make things saying? difficult and all yes. that stuff. Yes. But think about business in this country 20, 30 years ago and business now. I think we're doing, we are tracking in the right direction in terms of legislation and support for businesses in this nation. Let me give you a quick example. Please. Prior to the Kibaki government, mm. NAC, if you remember, prior yeah. to that, uh, when they came in, they implemented a zero rating on motorbikes. Do you see what that policy has done? Look at our nation. Things move in this country via what? Motorbikes. Mm. They, that kind of innovation opened up employment for hundreds of thousands of people. Opened up industries. Industries such as mechanics for motorcycles. Um, sales of spare parts for motorcycles. I mean it. That one move, and then it allowed us to have an easier ride to get wherever you're going. If mm. it's raining, you get on a border and you go. Mm. That, that's the kind of innovation that we're talking about. And small changes like that add up over time. So I think we're in a better environment than we were 30 years ago. Great minds think alike. That same example, Jimmy broke it down for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, he has a bird's eye view of, like, how the yeah. country moves. Mm -hmm. So his example was, mm -hmm. like, 
of Kenya as a country. There was a time we had bicycle border borders. Then the Kibaki era ca came. Like this is the growth of Kenya as an economy. Mm -hmm. uh, bicycle border borders, mm -hmm. very popular. Then the policy came, motorbikes mm -hmm. came in. Mm -hmm. Then after some time, the population grows. It's like yeah. a unit. Yeah. People are in the taxi culture, like, yeah. hey, nini, yeah. wow. So small changes like that matter. But I, here's the thing. You and I, unless you're going to get into politics or advocacy, mm. are you going to change the laws? No. no. So what can you do now? In the environment that you're in, what potential is there? Okay. Reverend Julian was here. Did you interview him or you've, spoke, you've seen no, him no, in no, different I, I've places? I've seen him in different places. No problem. He has become significantly wealthy in this environment. But he has suffered. For, he, you know, he's a true definition of ups and, and downs. And they're not, he's not unique. There are others who've gone through the same. Yeah. So, but it's also because of the size of what he was trying to achieve at that time. Mm. Yeah. So you should limit your dreams at a certain point. <laughs> no. They eat you. And, and I think I'm this... not a fan of limiting. I'm a fan of being realistic and actually doing the work, doing the maths, figure out can we achieve this goal. And this, uh, to summarize, Kifunga, mm -hmm. this also, um, you, you said something about um, managing your, your money in a way that um, a friend of mine had this strategy. I don't know how practical it is on ground. Mm -hmm. But if you live on half your income for five years, mm -hmm. it means after five years, you can live for five years without doing nothing if you sustain the same the lifestyle. Same lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Right? So is it accurate to say mm -hmm. that if you can squeeze your problems, let's say you have 10,000, yeah. if you can squeeze all your problems and force them in 3,000, mm -hmm. you're actually in the right direction of creating wealth. Yes. Because what does that mean? You're taking control. And so here's the thing. When you talk about taking control, Yes. It's a process called budgeting. Now, when people hear budget, they think handcuffs. Oh, I will never spend again. Life is boring. Poor attitude towards budgeting. Budgeting is saying, these are the things that are important to me. How do we achieve them? So that you use what you have as efficiently as possible to achieve yes, the goals that you want. have. Now, does that mean that you have to squeeze some things out that... They're not necessary or they're not part of your goals? Yes. Does it mean that you take control of your life and you don't just give money just randomly like that? Yes. Does mm -hmm. that mean that you're being mean? No. It means that now you're saying, I'm budgeting for giving. Okay. Because okay. all of us have a limit. Okay. I'm sure you have had a relative who's been sick in hospital. Mm -hmm. They need money. Did you sell your, all your, did you sell your car? Did you sell a, your house? You didn't. Mm -hmm. okay. Why didn't you do that? Because you have a limit. Okay. So what budgeting is doing is it is setting a limit for yourself. Okay. And saying, this is how much I give. And if you're a generous person, the amount will be more than somebody else. So be generous to the limit that you have. If you're now just being generous and you don't know any limit, mm. then you're being foolish. And okay. poverty is at the door Those waiting days. for you. You, you have really changed my perspective, and I believe to most of our audience too, you've changed my perspective on stinginess. You've given it very beautiful names, and that's on a lighter note. Uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of accessing funds, two things. I feel attacked, but it's okay. <laughs> I, withdrew, I withdrew that comment. Final thing, Aki, before we let you go. So, Nanajua, if I touch on something else, we could go on forever. Yeah. Uh, we, we were discussing generational business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but before generational business, uh, are kidneys a consideration in terms of raising seed capital? No. People actually talk about that. <laughs> no, about. it's too high risk. <laughs> <laughs> but you say business you about weigh, risk. You have to weigh the risk. Mm. Uh, no, man. G give kidneys for those who are in need. If you're a donor, be a donor, but not to make money. You can't invest in no. Because okay. you only have two. If the other one goes wrong, that risk is too high. Then you'll be the one in need also. But you can have one and syndicate an amount. <laughs> so I guess that's... I amount. leave that case there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you said uh, the Ford business, when you yeah. talk... To mm, yeah. tunai. New money, old money. Yeah. Right? Uh, so I, I have this argument that uh, old money is money that cannot finish whatever you do, yeah. however you spend it. Right? 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to know the truth uh, behind that. Uh, new money, how do you know you're walking into old money? And then uh, generational money. Yeah. Uh, Ford Company was your example, Kasema. It's yeah. a great, great uh, someone, grandchild, yeah. who's, who sits at the board or yeah. something, right? Yeah. Isn't that nepotism? Or sometimes um, <laughs> working with family yeah. is the best way to ensure the longevity of your business. No, what I, was trying, what I was trying to illustrate with the Ford Motor Company is that it is generational wealth. So if you go and look at the directors, global directors of Ford Motor Company, you'll find the name Ford there multiple times. Okay. What does that mean? Henry Ford, who started that business over 100 years ago, mm-hmm. his family is still benefiting from that idea. Okay. And they're still growing on the wealth that was there. And that's what it means. We as a nation need to grow generation. Gen- hey, now you know where I'm from. Generational wealth. Mm. We need to be able to pass on to our kids so that they're not starting from the same position that we are. Otherwise, the nation is stagnant. We need to be able to hand over, but not hand over wealth that is just going to be wasted. That's the mistake that we make, is that we don't train the next generation to do even more than what we have done. So if you hand over money to somebody who has not been trained, that's where things fall apart. But when there's a succession journey and a succession plan and a culture of succession, then you're going to see wealth grow from generation to generation to generation. And it's not just Ford. I've told you uh, an amazing business here is a business called English Press. It's on Enterprise Road. Mm. That's a third generation business. It's one of the, it, it, I believe it's actually the biggest offset printer in Africa. Yes, yes. What does that mean? They do most of the glossy magazines, school books, all these things are printed there. Mm. This is a third generation business that started with their grandfather in Kijabe with one printer. Okay. That printer is still in their office there when you go to the factory. That Kawan printer that is hand crank. Okay. His son brought the business to Nairobi. I think they were there, Luthuli Avenue, wherever all the printing is done, so you know, mm. in downtown yes. Nairobi. Now it's the third generation that is doing what you're seeing here. Okay. But that was built on passing knowledge of how business works from generation to generation. Thank you. We need to change our business culture here in Africa to understand how business works and train the next generation so that you can be able to, to see it grow beyond what it was in the first place. Thank you. Can I correct you on one thing? Mm-hmm. Old money that you can just spend the way that you want. No. It's not true. There are serious controls many times around that. Mostly using legal tools like businesses, trusts. So like in our classes at Centonomy, we have a whole class on estate planning. And we have a lawyer who comes in to begin to help you to understand, okay, if you want beneficiaries to continue to benefit from this wealth that you have built, put it in an organized fashion, usually using businesses or trusts that allow you to do that. That's usually what helps to sustain over many generations. Asante. Yeah. Asante Sana, and uh, as we close, yeah. I'd like to quote you on, you say, if you hand over money to people who have not been trained, mm-hmm. that is losing money. That is it. Asante Sana for sticking with us up to this point. I hope you enjoyed our content. I trust it was time well wasted. Please consider joining us by hitting subscribe and turning on the notifications bell. We have so much good vibes already uploaded on the channel. We have a lot more coming through. Otherwise, I'm your host, Dr. Kimori, see you on the next one.